Hello everybody, uh, I'm Jonathan Forrest and uh, I'm an abstract painter. I live and primarily work uh, on Vancouver Island uh, in the city of Nanaimo, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territory of the Snunemu First Nation. Uh, thank you to Amy Friend from the Visual Art Department at Brock University uh, for inviting me to talk as part of the Walker Cultural Leaders Project. And thanks to everyone who's um, uh, logging in and listening to this talk. So before I, I actually get into the talk, part of me believes uh, you shouldn't actually really talk about your work. Uh, partly because of the fear that by if you say something specific about it, it ends up becoming the explanation. Uh, when the reality is that um, really you're just talking about particular aspects of the work. Um, but obviously if I didn't talk about my work this would be a very short presentation so um, I'm going to um, launch into things and um, I'll just be talking around my painting practice and I'll, I'll try to put it in some sort of context. Um, I'd encourage uh, anyone who's interested to actually um, uh, to look at my paintings and uh, uh, ideally look at the paintings in person to see actually the real thing. Ultimately, the paintings do a much better job of explaining themselves um, than I can. So. Um, there's a number of questions uh, that, I, that I'll get to in the, in the talk, uh, but before I get to those, I thought I'd give you a bit of my background. I went through university in the early 1980s, uh, getting my BFA in 1983 from the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Uh, by my third year in university, I was pretty much uh, uh, committed to painting and uh, committed to abstraction. Um, since I've uh, since I got out of university, I've set up various um, various studios in Saskatoon, uh, where I lived until 2013. Uh, first, I've rented various uh, uh, studio spaces in warehouse buildings around Saskatoon. Um, then eventually, we we bought a house and. Um, I converted the uh, double garage uh, into my studio there. Um, about 15 years ago, I purchased a large old church uh, that uh, is about an hour east of Saskatoon. And I've um, basically used that studio to work on larger pieces. About, about seven years ago, uh, we moved from Saskatoon to Nanaimo and um, but I still use that, uh, still go back to Saskatchewan and, and, and use the church studio uh, for a few months each summer. A lot of the interests that I have in painting stem from a combination of, of what I'd call personal leanings um, and uh, the coincidence of where I ended up living and who I ended up studying with uh, in my late teens and early 20s. Um, this would be the early 1980s uh, in the art department at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, in Saskatoon at that time, there was, there was a rich painting community going back many, many generations. Um, and abstract painting was something that was definitely in the air at, at that time. Um, I ended up studying with a number of important uh, artists, but I'd say that uh, uh, taking my uh, second and third year painting from um, uh, Saskatoon artist Robert Christie uh, w was a turning point for me. Uh, a number of the ideas and possibilities uh, discussed in these classes pretty much formed the basis of, uh, of what I built my, uh, my career on. After university, uh, I was also lucky enough to attend a number of the Emma Lake artist workshops. Uh, first one I went to was, um, I think, 1985, and I went to a number of them 
all the way through right until about uh, uh, 2010. Uh, these workshops were, were key to a sort of hands-on approach to learning for me. As a young painter, it was thrilling to spend two weeks side by side painting, um, painting with such a range of artists. You learn by doing, by making something, trying it on for size. Uh, my experience was more like an, an apprenticeship, um, more like learning a craft uh, through making. I also had the good fortune to hang out with some younger artists in Saskatoon and through my connections with the older generations of painters uh, I ended up um, uh, sort of hanging out in many studios, getting in on various studio visits and whatnot. Um, Saskatoon in the 80s was a place where there was a, a constant stream of visitors um, from out of town, from like critics, curators, visiting artists, there, there seemed like there was always somebody coming through town. Um, and because of the small size of the city um, and the small size of the painting community, we all got to meet everyone and often they'd end up doing studio visits with you. There was about a 10 year period through the 80s into the early 90s that was very stimulating. Uh, and it's, it's, I would sort of put it down to this odd combination of um, Saskatoon's size, its location, um, the Emma Lake Artist Workshops for sure played a part, and um, the community's history with painting. And it, it was a very interesting place uh, to grow up in as, a, as an early developing artist. And I managed to just catch the tail end of, of that energy. So that's a bit of my, uh, my background. Uh, there are several uh, questions that I'll add. Uh, I, there are several questions that I'll address in this talk. Uh, the first one being, which comes first, ideas or process? So these are so intertwined in my practice that it's hard to separate them out and there's a constant back and forth between the two. Of course I have my own definition definition of what an idea is and what a, what a process is but for the sake of being able to talk about it I'll call the process the physical act of painting or how the paint is applied to the canvas and I'd call the idea what I think about before, during and after making the painting. So process. The act of painting is relatively easy to describe. It's about putting paint on canvas. You could describe all my paintings as some variation of using some tool to apply paint of various thicknesses and colors onto a rectangular canvas. I've always had an interest in using process as kind of as a way to get away from myself, away from what I can think of. Um, a process can uh, can create a kind of a space, a mental space or distance where in the making of the painting something can happen that's not tightly bound to your will. It's not tightly tied to what you can think of. My process over the years, a, a consistent thing that I've noticed I keep coming back to is coming up with various sort of do-it-yourselves, do-it-yourself apparatuses or systems that I make up uh, to make the paintings. Um, these systems can seem elaborate or convoluted. I don't know. Why not just use a brush? Well, of course, a brush is an early tool that itself is an apparatus that can create that same kind of mental space. And really, I think of my systems as equivalent to a brush. They're just the most convenient way for me at that time to make those paintings. I should also say that I don't normally talk about my process either. Partly because um, I'm not that interested in the process becoming a performance. To me, the studio is a place to play away from observation, free from judgment. I'm not interested in mythologizing the, pro the process or fetishizing the materials. For me, these things are just a means to an end. 
I don't really see any inherent value in these in these various processes themselves that I've come up with. They're really just a useful way to make the paints. I should also mention that none of these approaches uh, were thought up beforehand. Really, they were all developed intuitively in response to situations that happen in the paintings. One painting leads to the next, and as the, as the need arises, I come up with technical solutions to help me making the paint. Often, most if not all my ideas and processes are pulled out of what's in the air and and sort of retooled, as it were, for my own uh, for my own use. So, um, I'll give some examples of the various process processes that I've that I've tried over the years. Um, when I was first out of school, I uh, I set up a studio uh, in a, a sort of shared studio setup uh, in downtown Saskatoon, and I. Um, I uh, came up with this um, sort of vertical plywood panel that I had against the wall and uh, with a kind of trough at the bottom of it to catch paint overflow. And I'd pour stains over and over the painting tacked up to the board and uh, it would catch the stain at the bottom that I would scoop up and reuse and put back onto the, onto the painting. Um, later in the 80s I kind of sort of modified that process to a more um, horizontal version of this setup that kind of extended out onto the floor so I could take advantage of, of uh, paint spilling off the edge of the canvas, off the bottom of the canvas and uh, sort of catch that kind of accidental um, sort of paint phenomena. Um, another example would be in the mid-90s where I would uh, I uh, started painting off by draping it over um, a number of one by two sticks to create um, sort of troughs or waves in the canvas where the um, where the paint would pool when I when I poured on the, on the paint. Uh, another example would be uh, at an Emma Lake workshop in 2000 where I uh, came up with this process of, of squeegeeing uh, sort of a large area of paint. Um, in a kind of one-shot application and, and the, the sort of motivation behind that was really the workshop uh, was only two weeks long and I'd, I'd sort of before that workshop been in the habit of layering and layering paint up to sort of create a very thick surface on a painting but it took months and months to get there so I thought well I can't do that at the workshop so I um, sort of came up with this idea that, um, well, if you just kind of laid down a kind of thick extrusion of paint right on the first few days, then uh, uh, you'd be, you'd have the next two weeks where you could kind of keep paint over that, that kind of thick of things. So it was sort of a, a, a sort of, um, uh, you know, I was trying to kind of do a short a shortcut to get the thick paint down. But then, of course, as, as the way things go, the process turns into something else. And I've been basically using a version of that uh, process ever since, including using scrapers and plexiglass strips to, to do all sorts of different shapes. And right through to today, where I have a, a, a painting table set up with a system of rails so that I can sort of pull thin sheets of paint very evenly across uh, large areas of the canvas. So that's a sort of uh, little bit about my process. Um, then next is ideas. Um, and ideas are much harder to pin down in my work. Um, mainly because ideas could seem like they, they should be theory or research. Um, and on the surface, there's, there isn't much of that in, in my work. Um, but, the, but there is a lot of thought that goes into the making of the paintings. And, in, and you know, over 35 years and counting, you know, a lot of time and, and uh, sort of mental energy has gone into it, as well as the, the, the physical energy. Um, 
I'm keen on looking at as much painting as possible, traveling to see specific shows, and I'm constantly reading artists' writings, critical responses to artists' work. But I don't really think of that as a specific research for a body of work or series. I consider that just being informed about my, my field of practice. There are general ideas that go back to my formative years in the 80s, that a painting can be abstract, not overtly refer to anything outside itself, can use the formal elements of, of color, shape, line, and texture to create a painting that can give a deep moving experience to the viewer. You could call that an idea or a philosophy or, or maybe just an inherited habit. Um, you know, in a, in a way it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like it is what it is and it's, it's, it's a way to get started in the studio. I can think of a lot of other artists work that if you kind of if you describe their approach it would completely contradict everything I've been talking about and yet uh, despite all that um, despite everything that we say about painting there's there's something that ties all painting together and that potentially offers a unique art experience that that um, that other art forms can offer but saying you're only interested in the formal uh, properties of painting isn't quite accurate either. Regardless of your philosophical stance towards paintings, there's always a context to the work. The most obvious, con uh, the most obvious context is the coincidence of your biography. Where you live, um, the people you come in contact with, uh, the time, the when you live, the time you live, um, and, and all the ideas that are in the air. Um, I've mentioned generally some bio biographical details in my introduction, but uh, becoming, a painting in, becoming a painter in Saskatoon at the time I did exposed me to a set of specific circumstances that are quite unique. There are the people that I met who influenced me, the ones whose ideas I rejected, the paintings I, I looked at that were accessible to me locally, uh, what made sense to me, what didn't. Um, curiously, most of the artists that I went through university with and a few years after, they had pretty much the same circumstances and most of them developed in quite different ways and quite different directions than I did. So I have to think there's something in my own sensibility that um, that found abstract painting to be fertile ground. So combined with this kind of um, coincidental context, you could say, um, there are all the experiences that I've, that I've uh, intentionally sought out. Specifically attending the Emma Lake workshops, traveling to see firsthand paintings, seeking out artists and thinkers that that can enrich and broaden my view of painting, uh, all in a dialogue with my ongoing studio practice, and the learning continues. So, in terms of specific ideas around my work, I'll give a few examples from various series over the years. Um, I'll go back again to Emma Lake and my experience at the workshops, which I think are pretty similar uh, to a lot of artists who attended them over the years. There was this intense, intense energy created by the people there, the work being done, the conversations happening. It was a place of possibilities. But I noticed after attending a few workshops that the energy of the work I did during the two-week session didn't seem to carry forward into my regular studio practice. I could learn from what I did, but it almost took a rethinking after the workshop to incorporate any, any new ideas into my work. I started to think that in a way, even though I was painting abstractly, with no reference to any imagery, that whatever I painted at the workshop somehow contained the experiences that I had at the workshop. It was as if the paintings wouldn't be the same if those specific people hadn't been there, if different conversations were had. So I started to develop this idea of painting as a diary. Sort of like seeing a shape across a shared studio, seeing a color, having somebody respond or not respond uh, to, to work that I was doing, all affected the work. 
It's these vague things nudged the work in ways that I couldn't quite articulate, but it seemed these experiences were somehow embedded into the paintings. And at this point now, I can look back over a series of paintings and see them as markers of time, of my life. So things like going for a walk, seeing the landscape and changing light, all the day-to-day -day mundane experiences all get filtered into the work. My, my studio practice definitely has a side to it that is about a, a kind of a conversation with, with my, um, with, sort of with contemporary painters that I think about, as well as, um, as, well as with, the, with, with the history of painting. It's uh, it's sort of like an alternative to a verbal conversation that I'm that I'm having with these people. One of painting's great assets is its past. Painting comes out of painting. Um, it's a long tradition, and it it, it goes back uh, even to those uh, the those cave paintings, or or even before that. Um, you know, imagine the. The, the the hand silhouette uh, on on the cave, but you know then rush forward to to Titian to Matisse at uh, you know nineteen nineteen ten fifteen uh, to to the present. It's thousands of years of painting, um, and that long history informs everything that is going on on today. It's a very rich past that on the one hand establishes all these conventions of painting, but the conventions give us something which we can butt up against to and push and uh, and change. So next question is what pushes your practice and why do you make art? Well, at, at, at this point, um, at, the, at this point in, the, in my journey uh, as, a, as an artist, I've, I've got a pretty regular, uh, uh, regular routine of working in the studio. Uh, I've got a nice, nice habit of, of, of working most days, and um, I'm a big believer in, in having routine as a way to, um, a way to kind of get the work done. So now, I, I, what happens to me is if I, if for some reason, I'm not working, it starts to feel awkward, not normal. So um, it, it, I don't feel at ease unless I've got a regular studio practice going. For the past few years, I painted full time without a day job, and I've simplified my life. So most days are spent in the studio focusing on painting. Thinking back to earlier days, I used to juggle a lot of different commitments, including a day job, family, but I always managed to get the time in the studio, whether it was evenings or weekends. And, well, to be honest, early on, there's, you have a sort of a, a, a youthful creativity that is a great thing that propelled me forward, giving me the energy to work around all the other commitments. I've also noticed that having exhibitions um, helps kind of consolidate what you're doing, brings it together. Um, exhibitions are important career-wise, but they also just, it's, it's like it's, uh, it gives you a chance to assess what you've done, sort of, a, um, sort of a point to stop, look at what you've been doing and, and, and make some value judgments. Um, but ultimately, it's the ongoing studio practice that sustains me. I know when I'm working to my fullest potential, and when I am, it's very satisfying. There are many frustrations, stops and starts, roadblocks to overcome, but the closer I get to a steady day-to-day -day painting practice, the better I feel. I've also, I, I've always had this feeling that, that it's just around the corner whatever it is, um, that I'm never quite there, but I keep going because I feel close and, and can feel the potential. And that's, that's a great feeling that 
that, that pushes you pushes you forward and keeps keeps me moving so next question how do you know when a body of work is finished well thinking back over you know several decades of painting the certain patterns kind of have emerged and um, yeah, I could describe the sort of uh, the, the the pattern that I've observed, which is sort of an initial discovery, uh, followed by a kind of exploration, that's then followed by repetition, and then eventually stagnation sets in, and it's at that point that it's time to move on, and then usually there's a sort of transitional period that. And the traditional transition period usually takes a huge amount of work, and um, it's sort of like you got to strip everything down to to basics and uh, rethink your approach to painting. Um, it's usually a very hard process to go through, but a, a very healthy process, and eventually does lead to new things and new discoveries. So I'll give a few examples of some series that I made over the last few years that will sort of try to illustrate that, those points. Um, this is a series I made over a couple of years around 217 and 218. Um, after a period of experimentation and trying a number of different approaches, I settled on a, on a triangular shape uh, on a colored ground as a way to explore color and transparency. I started all these paintings by doing a small sketch and coming up with the color combinations. Then I'd start applying the transparent colors layer by layer on top of the color ground. The layout was fixed and sort of determined at the beginning of the painting, but the specifics of the color and the transparencies constantly changed. And it constantly changed as I was painting the canvas. Most of these works took about a month to, to finish so, in a way, it was a matter of following the general plan that I had set up with the sketch, letting the color emerge, and at the end of those steps, the painting was finished. It may or may not be any good, but it's done. So, I'll contrast this with another example of a series of works I made right after that, in late 2018 and 2019. I made these works partly in reaction to the more pre-planned work that I'd just been working on. And I just wanted to start these paintings with a general concept of just scraping paint, layers of paint over and over, not knowing how it would go, but hoping that something would happen and something would emerge. It was a very interesting experience for me. I'd scrape a layer of paint onto the canvas and it was just paint on canvas. I'd scrape another layer over, and I was very aware that it was just another layer of materials over that. And I would repeat and repeat that, hoping or trusting that something would happen. And often it was at the last pass, or last pass of paint that I put on, that somehow it kind of brought it all together and made a sort of leap from becoming just the materials to becoming a painting or becoming art. The challenge was to keep pushing the painting until the painting made that leap. So these are two sort of uh, uh, sort of opposite examples in my work, but I would say that I'm continuing swinging back and forth between those poles of of having a sort of more of a of a plan of what I'm doing and 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 um, swing to. A sort of a, an unknown, just see what happens, a way of, way of making paintings. So on to the next question is, can you offer any advice to artists and students studying art today? So, um, everyone has their own life situation and expectations of what they want to achieve, so it's very hard to give specific advice. However, my situation May offer um, may offer some alternative path to what uh, to what uh, what other people are saying. Um, it was clear to me early on 
that um, having a studio practice required quite a bit of time and money. And it was clear from the example of the Yodorars around me that it would take a long time before I'd actually get, um, make any money from painting sales. Um, it was also pretty clear to me that it's going to take me a long time to develop as an artist. So what I did is I went out and got a day job to pay the bills and a job that left me enough energy and time to paint in the evenings and weekends. I developed a regular studio practice that was sort of self-sustaining in the sense that motivation came from what happened in the studio um, as opposed to external reward. Although it did help whenever anything, uh, you know, anything external happened, like whether it was a studio visit or a chance to show the work uh, or even the odd sale. In terms of a sort of a general attitude, I try to be open to everything happening in my field of interest. In painting, that means being open to all approaches to contemporary painting, and also to the history of painting from all time periods, countries, styles, and movements. When looking at painting, judgment is important at some point, but suspending judgment, taking everything in, letting it sit and percolate, that's been a lot more beneficial to me in the long run. Suspending judgment in the studio is, is also a very valuable practice. Letting things flow and just seeing where it'll go has been far more beneficial to me than judging every move. At some point judgment does come into it, but you don't always want to be stopping and taking your temperature, worrying if this is the right or wrong thing to do. Better to just jump in and figure it out later. Painting takes time to reveal itself. I try to put aside all the art world baggage. I've made an effort to separate what I am told I should experience versus what I actually experience. And I've learned to trust my own experience more and more. It's hard to make paintings. It takes time, energy, resources, and commitments. So if an artist has bothered to make a body of work, then there's probably something that I can learn from it, even if, it's, even if it seems not to be directly related to what I'm doing. There are many shows that I've seen that I just, I haven't got it at the time, but after the fact, it, it kind of, it starts to make sense, and, I, and years, decades later, it's like, I wish I could see those shows again. Um, there's a few examples I could give of this slow reveal. I can remember going to New York for the first time in the mid-80s with the idea that I was going to just go see as much painting as I could. Um, New York is a great place to go where you can sort of see the most paintings in the least amount of time. It's packed full. So going around uh, at the Museum of Modern Art um, one of the artists I wanted to look at, because I'd, I'd, I'd uh, learned about him in school, was Matisse. And there's a number of kind of classic Matisse's uh, at MoMA, uh, some great pieces. And, um, but one of the ones that I saw there that uh, is a view of, of Notre Dame, it's a medium-sized vertical painting uh, that Matisse painted in 1914. Um, when I saw the painting in person, it, it was baffling to me. I learned that Matisse was a colorist, and this painting, it's like it was kind of just a kind of muddy blue. I would sort of thought of Matisse as playing, playing color areas off color areas, and uh, this painting, it was basically all this muddy blue, there was a little bit of pink and a little bit of green in there, but um, uh, it just didn't make sense. And the other thing that didn't make sense is the paint surface looked like it had pretty much all been washed off. It wasn't classic paint handling that I had sort of imagined that, that Matisse's work would have. It seemed very kind of um, sort of uh, summarily uh, sort of... Uh, put on and taken off and there you were kind of thing. And then, then there's black lines all over and scratchy drawing. And it just didn't really seem to jive with what I was expecting. 
Of course, I was making these judgments based on what I had been taught rather than what I was actually experiencing. So, fortunately, I've kept going back to New York. I always check in with this painting. Um, at some point, I must have um, dropped my guard of, 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 of what I'd learned because gradually the painting has slowly revealed itself to me and it's become one of my favorite Matisse's. It's, it's sort of a, a pet peeve of mine is, is pigeonholing artists and summing up what they do, which often leads to a kind of total misrepresentation of their work. Um, painting, an artist's work can't be explained in an elevator pitch. And part of my resistance to talking about my own work is that what an artist says about their work can can explain or open a door into the work, but it, it can also limit or narrow a viewer's potential experience of the work. Another example of bringing my own baggage to an artwork happened in the same trip. Uh, it's the mid-80s and um, I was heavily uh, sort of steeped in a sort of a gestural painterly approach to paintings and a play of surfaces of thick and thin. And uh, I kind of had this simplistic view that you sort of could judge paintings on, you know, how the paint was thrown around and how thick and thin that paint was. So talk about a, a sort of imposing a very a limited view on, on what you're looking at. So, anyway, I'm in New York and I go into the Frick Museum and I notice uh, uh, the Titian painting, Portrait of a Man with a Red Cap from 1510. He was on my checklist of, of what I should be looking at, so um, I took a look at the painting and I used my benchmark of thick and thin and, uh, well, the painting kind of fell flat. So I kind of dismissed the painting as historical and moved on. A few years later, I revisited the painting and started to get an inkling that maybe there was something there. I kept going back over the years and checked in with this painting. And one visit going to, see, going to the Frick and looking at this painting is I walked into the room and suddenly looked over and I suddenly just got the painting. It's like a classic aesthetic reaction, or sort of a shiver down the spine, the sense that the painting just made sense, was full, that had, it had everything. So I keep checking in with this old friend as years go by. Sometimes it gives me a lot, sometimes just a bit, but it's always worth a visit. There are many, many paintings that I've uh, experienced like this, and gradually I've come to the realization that getting a painting is often more about me opening up to the work rather than the painting not having anything to say. So the last question is, can I reflect on my experience as an artist during COVID? I would have to say that 2020 has been um, one of the most disrupted years of painting that I've had for a long time. You know, when COVID hit, it's, uh, you know, the anxiety about it pretty much threw a wrench into my painting practice. Um, you know, I've had several good runs over the year in the studio, but it's been very much a kind of a stop and start year. You get a month of solid work and then a month of, of worry where not much gets done, so. For me, it's pretty much impossible to get a regular practice, painting practice going if I'm, you know, if I've got too much in, in, on my mind. And so, you know, with the pandemic, there was a lot of, you know, worry over family members, worrying over our finances, um, you know, personal safety, all of those things, um, you know, suddenly it, it became kind of all consuming and it seemed like there was no mental space left for painting. But, uh, you know, that was very intense in, in the first few months, you know, March, April. Uh, but, you know, gradually by, by the summer, um, you know, things uh, things did start to, to settle down in my mind, but um, 
you know, it was all very stressful. You know, there was the, you know, you know there's my personal situation, but there's also the, the, the wider financial situation, how it affects the, the Canadian art economy, uh, commercial galleries, you know, all of which ties to, a, um, you know, how do we how do we make a living and keep going? So it's just a really kind of clear reminder to me of how important a, a stable day-to-day -day routine is to get work done. A, a, a reminder that painting really is a luxury that's not possible if you don't have the basics of life taken care of. You know, on the flip side of that, I noticed that after a period of not working, forcing myself to get to work was really therapeutic and it reminded me of how valuable a painting practice is for me, how it gives focus to my creative energy, how it gives meaning to my life. Another reminder is that, uh, you know, experiencing painting must involve at some point actually seeing the work in person, in real life. Uh, the pandemic has obviously affected both getting my work out into the world to be seen, but also stopped me from being able to get out and look at art, other artists' work, which has been an ongoing source of inspiration. You know, sure, you can check in digitally on some things, and there's been some great lectures that I've listened to that I would not normally have been able to attend. But really, I look forward to being able to get out in, into studios, to galleries, to museums, to stand in front of the work and soak it in. Thank you for listening to me and thank you to Brock University for inviting me to talk. I'd encourage anyone interested in my work to, to look up um, information on my website at jonathanforrest.com and when it's safe to visit galleries in person, um, the nearest place to Brock University to see examples of my work, uh, my recent work is at Michael Gibson Gallery in London, Ontario. Thank you very much.